so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Jim Lee, and I'm an associate professor of Asian American Studies and English at, at, uh, here at UCI, and also the director of the Center for Medical Humanities. Before I proceed with introducing tonight's panel, I want to say some words of gratitude. First, I want to thank the two center staff people who have made this event um, and all center-related activities possible, uh, Makanae Salah and Joanne Jamura. Thank you also to Amanda Swain, Executive Director of the Humanities Center. This event and much of the center's programming this year is possible thanks to a generous grant provided by the Mellon Foundation. Its Sawyer Seminar provides resources to enable critical and necessary conversations uh, in our intellectual community. And the theme of our Sawyer Seminar, what brings us here this evening, is the theme of suffering. I want to acknowledge Dr. Sarah Oram, our Sawyer postdoctoral fellow, who's currently uh, giving a job talk, so I wish her well. Oh, wow. And Marlon Maldonado and Max Spear are Sawyer graduate students, um, who have been so instrumental in uh, all of the events thus far. I hope you uh, take some time and say hello to them and share your thoughts about this and other events that we host. I also want to let you know of an exciting event taking place tomorrow evening. Lana Lynn, one of our panelists, will be screening her recently completed film, The Cancer Journals Revisited, across the way in the McCormick Screen Room, 5 p.m. tomorrow. Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harard from Afri African American Studies will offer a brief comment following the screening, and I hope you'll consider joining us and or letting others know tomorrow's event. Before I briefly, uh, and, I, and I do mean brief to just give as much time to our panelists as possible. Um, the readings that uh, the panelists will be refer referencing uh, is available for download. If you have not been able to yet, you can go to bit.ly slash illness as method and you can download the readings. And if you would like to follow along, you may do so. So let me be very, let me briefly introduce our amazing panelists. I'm kind of, this is like my fanboy event. I'm very excited. Patrick Anderson is Professor of Expressive Culture and Performance at the University of California, San Diego. He is the author of Autobiography of a Disease, published by Rutledge in 2017. Mel Chen is Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at UC Berkeley and Director of the Center for the Study of Sexual Culture. They are the author of Animacies, Biopolitics, Racial Mattering, and Queer Affect, published by Duke in 2012. Lachlan Jane is Professor of Anthropology at Stanford University and a Visiting Professor of Global Health and social medicine at King's College London. They are the author of Malignant House Cancer Becomes Us, published by UC Press in 2013. Finally, Lana Lin is an artist scholar and an associate professor of film theory at Dig and digital cinema, cinema at the New School. She is the author of Freud's Jaw and Other Lost Objects, Fractured Subjectivity in the Face of Cancer, published by Fordham in 2017. The format for this evening is as follows. Each scholar has read a portion of another's book and has prepared questions based on this reading. Each conversation will last about 15 minutes, after which we will open the discussion to everyone in this room. For those interested, you can uh, read uh, uh, alongside as we have the conversation. Tonight's order, tonight's menu, will be as follows. Mel will interview Lachlan. Lachlan interviews Lana. Lana interviews Patrick, and Patrick interviews Mel. So without further ado, please join me in thanking and welcoming our four scholars, Illness is Method. OK, um, please, everyone, um, uh, do whatever you need to do to stay comfortable. Um, and uh, if I fade, please just uh, raise your hand or do something else and let me know. Um, I think we've all agreed that we're going to have fun tonight. Um, and it, there's something maybe inappropriate and then also incredibly appropriate about making fun with illness as method. Um, and then simultaneously, I think uh, maybe Lachlan and I will um, get us started um, first by thinking through um, Lachlan's um, two chapters that hopefully um, you all have to begin our, at least our extended act of improvisation um, in thinking about illness as method, which also includes all of you. Um, <clears throat> so one of the 
questions that um, we're all supposed to address, which I think it's actually a good idea to start with, is uh, what did illness illuminate intellectually, methodologically, or otherwise that you may not have noticed um, during a more able-bodied or healthier state? And then a, a, a joint question is, what did illness teach you about the function of scholarship? So those are deep, they're, they're, they're very vast questions, um, and maybe a, a more fun question for me, which is the same kind of question, is uh, do you remember the first time that your illness um, came up against your scholarship, right? So imposing illness, and scholarship as these two things and that there was a kind of againstness that you felt, a friction or failure to allow. And also I was gonna say, uh, <laughs> this is like a high stress kind of thing where we're all supposed to come up with great ideas on the fly, so <laughs> just um, Thank you, the, the, like, <laughs> me leave, leave room for a lot of silence <laughs> and thinking and pondering and partial phrasing. Well, I think it's such an interesting question because <laughs> On rereading some of my own work in preparation for tonight, in, in with regard to that question, like, um, what did illness illuminate? And I remember just first starting journaling and thinking, I am not going to be that person who writes about their illness. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> not huh? right? And um, and then I gradually started doing it and started using those moments of like enforced, intense vulnerability as these ways into all of my resistance to social science writing that, that, that resisted going, like going there, going into that vulnerability and what kinds of insights that gives you. And so when you first asked me that question, I was like, yeah, I remember exactly what that is, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's way too embarrassing. <laughs> right? So, so there's a way even going back to when I wrote, like looking at that yeah. conclusion or whatever, I didn't even read it, like I skimmed over it and I kind of thought, I don't, I don't want to put myself in that position again. Mm -hmm. I don't want to re-remember what I wrote and why I wrote it. Like there were yeah. just so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I really felt at the time that I had to go there. Like there was something mm -hmm. about the experience that I felt like there is something here that needs to be unpacked. And this is the only place from which I can do it. Right, and so then thinking about later on in the process, then thinking about like, who's this narrator going to be? How will I represent them? To what extent are they me? To what extent am I a mm -hmm. trustworthy narrative? Mm -hmm. In doing this, you know, quite academic work, or at least the questions are um, from the perspective, from the very personal perspective, and th and that person was also a very specific person. Like that's not me anymore in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. in the whole way. Discussions about identity have changed, discussions about gender have changed. Like I would, you know, if I were to write that book now, it would be a very different kind of book, obviously. So maybe that's part of my resistance in going back to it, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. you know? Um, that's, that's a wonderful answer. Um, <clears throat> I think you got at the, the kind of trick of time uh, that um, <clears throat> becomes an ever greater trick the, the longer the time is you know, between you as a, an ill self and the work you produce um, in relation to that, um, to, to those me methodological choices you make <clears throat> and the present day you. So I, I, I did um, have some follow up questions about, yeah, the you, the you now, does the you now, so just before we assembled for the panel, we were talking about the, um, how odd it is that uh, writing as, as illness or illness as method still somehow seems exceptional or unusual in ordinary scholarship, um, given the ubiquity of forms of illness or of kind of, you know, modulated selves under various kinds of regimes of health. Like, we, we know this is, uh, this is the condition in some ways, right, of being intellectuals, and yet, right, how is it still a marked thing? How does it still um, create a, a kind of challenge for you, um, and I'm not making assumptions about the, the illness of your present self, um, uh, but maybe I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, what it would mean to adopt some of the same methodological choices, even if you aren't the same person, especially in 
a kind of environment in which illness is ordinary and still marked, right? Is that, is that too much? I don't know, that's a um, really hard question. Um, uh, especially because I consider my ill self in the past, but then there are always <coughs> these ill adjacent things that one comes up against as, you know, every, people have scars or memories or ways of dealing with just trauma or vulnerability that one has learned through the experience, of, through a traumatic experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I come up against those even in the way I communicate or the way I'm in a relationship or what I expect from a relationship or, or things like that yeah. that are not exactly um, because of being an ill self, but because of having been an ill self. Mm -hmm. ill self. So I guess yeah. that's what you're getting yeah, yeah. at, right? This, this temporality where you're not that person anymore, but absolutely physically and socially and psychically mm -hmm. marked by that in ways that we all have different ways of getting over or having you know, processed or, yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? And some of those are, are so hard to articulate or even think about. Mm -hmm. But that's a super interesting question that I hadn't yeah. thought about in those terms quite before. Uh, I'm thinking now about pedagogy, which is a different kind of temporality. I'm thinking about um, just a really simple configuration. Students come to you for guidance, and they have been influenced by, um, you know, what I could say is one thing you've done for the field, right? So you have. Um, made a contribution to um, social science methods, right? We can take that large perspective and informed by that, you have students who want um, some form of, of learning pedagogy about this method. Um, uh, do you have anything you might like to share about what it means to be teaching this work or teaching uh, modes of vulnerability and disclosure um, that have to do with, uh, or that remain a very intense um, kind of practice within academic um, work. Yeah, I th and I think part of the, the thing about teaching is that we have our students for such brief periods of time, right? And that, that way of learning and teaching critical thought already is difficult. And then teaching it in relation to, uh, you know, I was talking about the narrator and then autobiography and being able to understand one's own experience and then being able to link it to the broader questions in the field is so, so difficult. And I think, um, I think what is the most amazing part of it is students can see you know, everybody on this panel's work and see how people have, have broached that topic and, 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 and have, a, have a new feeling about the potential of social science work and what it, what it can be and how it can move people and have this kind of, people can have an affective connection to it in a way that so much other work um, doesn't do that. And I feel like that's the best of it, right? Is to get to move students into being interested in the work and into doing it and realizing that this stuff is important to their own experiences and how they relate to the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like yeah. that's, you know, that's the beginning of what we get to do as, yeah. as instructors and teachers. Um, thank you for that. Uh, um, I'd love to just talk about a little, a little bit that, uh, of something I noticed in the text itself. I mean, we were given two chapters, and they are contiguous, so you shift from one chapter to the other. But I also felt the shift in um, mood or voice, uh, even the uses of language. Um, I think we proceeded from um, uh, a kind of um, uh, a description of how um, RCT works, um, and it proceeds in a kind of um, amiable pacing, a kind of descriptive pacing, to the next chapter, which is rubble, bakelite bodies, and you start calling forth stuff. You, you start talking about uh, the null of scraps, the cusp objects, the cancer stuff, and my favorite, the dreaded mound, um, and, and, <laughs> uh, and the references to kind of various um, paraphernalia that were in relation to um, your and other, um, uh, one other person's cancer as well, which I also thought was super interesting. But there was a kind of beautiful 
disorder or disjoining that comes in in that chapter. Um, and I also really love your citation of, I think at one point you're just like, I'm, I'm a dyke from San Francisco. Um, and I, dyke has this very you know, particular register. Um, you can say more about that. But I, so there's a lot that happened for me around, as a reader, around language and, and register and mood and order that was amazing um, and was different from the previous chapter. And that's where you go, you know, that's where you're actually narrating your own, a lot of your own stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you might have anything to say just about, we're talking about method, it's such a vague word, but yeah. do, is there anything you might isolate as method in that? Um, I, I think I'm allergic to method, like I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I did my PhD in history of consciousness and we never really learned method. <laughs> and it's plagued me for the rest of my life. I can never get funding because I can never identify my method. Or whatever. But, but, you know, having said that, obviously there is a method. But I think um, one of the hardest parts about doing this, pulling the book together as a book, is that each of the chapters had been written in very different registers. So at the very beginning of my publishing, I didn't want to kind of come out. You know, so I wrote a chapter called um, living in prognosis that I published as an article and didn't ever do any autobiographical mm -hmm. component to it, although it was built on that experience, obviously. Um, so all of the chapters were completely different in terms of their voicing. So I had to figure out some way of rewriting them all so they did fit together. And I think that last chapter, that conclusion, I felt like that was, that was the moment where I could let that personal voice, th because there didn't need to be I didn't think an argument is the same way that there did for the other chapters, that that could be my moment of like, um, I guess just talking about that mystery, like ending with that mystery at the end of treatment of this stuff you don't know what to do with, you don't know if you're gonna need it again. If you do, it's gonna be super valuable. If you don't, it's just garbage like that that mystery of what value is and when mm -hmm. value emerges um, as, a, as a question even. Um, and then that my sister-in-law had just passed away um, and then we were you know, moving back to San Francisco from Canada. There was just this way in which all of those things seemed to come together to, to provide a wrapping up of the, of the book and the questions um, that, I, that I wanted to address in a very personal kind of way. So I think that was the, that was the drive behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a method or just a, a meditation. I feel yeah. like it was a meditation. Yes, um, that's lovely. So in, in some ways, um, yeah, I could, I could read that last chapter as a meditation or even as a new set of questions, right, um, about if something remains, how do we characterize the value of that remainder? And I think I was struck also in this book by how resolutely, uh, oh, I'm getting a scam call right now, sorry. Uh, how, how resolutely um, your body became um, data, right? And these were, these were in part um, devices to ensure that data of your body. Right? Oh, that's so interesting because the whole thing was supposed to be about resisting <laughs> one's body becoming data, right? Like the, the constant, Sorry. yeah, you know, <laughs> that's awesome, but it is, yes. Um, because of that constant objectification yeah. and identification and aggregation and everything, and you're like, wait a sec, wait a sec, that's not cool. Um, you know, and a kind of, you know, nearly defensive reaction to that, but also being in that place is a really interesting place to understand the way in which data is collected by everybody else. And so that's right, that's a really important point of resistance is to be like, no, it's totally data, it's just a different kind, it's not what you think, mm -hmm. you know, and, and asserting that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, thank yeah. you. Do you think that, uh, am I, how, how am I with time? Getting close, one more question. Um, would you ascribe any kind of relationship between vulnerability and taking things personal, even though I just, I hate, I hate talking about things in that way. 
and the necessity you felt for a meditation rather than a conclusion. Yeah. Well, I feel like whenever I take things personally, then I get defensive, and then I hate being defensive, and I hate the whole thing about being defensive, you're not supposed to be defensive anyway. Um, so that, to me, provides a moment of, of thinking about it and trying to think about it in a different way, because one thing I didn't want to do is just make that argument like, mm -hmm. this sucks and it should be different. Obviously, that argument is in there, or that suggestion is in there. Yeah. But it's like, well, yeah, it sucks and it should be different, but it's, it's always going to suck and it's never going to be different. So then what does it become? Then it become, then I felt like then it becomes this um, kind of way to then meditate on what that, what that means for people who have to go through it, for people who lose things, lose people to it. Um, and, and we're all going through it all the time in so many ways. It's like, it's like what you were saying, people, everybody goes through this. And so whether or not we see it as normal or remarkable um, or tragic or every day makes all the difference to the way we live our lives and the way we get to understand the horrible things we're, we all will go through. I think that's it for now, but um, just thank you so much, Lachlan, for your work, and thank you for, you were, you were on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for this. Thank you so much for this fantastic chapter and for your work and for coming all the way from New York and for being here. Um, I just found your chapter so rich and suggestive, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, that intro vignette with the pig, I even laughed at them. And then I thought, I wonder if I could tell this joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the way, so, so you talk about the way it's simultaneously preserved and destroyed, and that's a theme that you come back to through the chapter, and I was really fascinated by that. You refer to it in light of the slow torture of cancer treatments, for example, and the literal taking of the body through cancer treatments, through the slash and burn um, technologies that, that one goes through. And then you also ask, I think rhetorically, kind of who benefits from the piecemeal destruction of the pig? Is it the farmer? Is it the pig? Um, and there's a way in which this is a kind of literal material analogy for injury and for medicine, right? The injuries um, that are the conserving impulses of medicine, which forces us to see, I thought, um, kind of the body as set against the mind or the kind of spirit inhabiting um, this and the kind of very basic fact that we all live in, we rely on, we're produced by this kind of house of meat, right? You can see in the pig, but it's harder to see ourselves as as meat. And, and so, um, so I thought that was just such a brilliant and poignant and descriptive way to open those questions. And I found it myself a particularly interesting foil to think about two things. And I'm going to say the first one, and then I'm going to stop talking, I promise. Um, which is, so the first thing is like, unlike animals, people do and don't, as you point out so beautifully, have these investments in different parts of their bodies. So Sedgwick has talked about this in those super interesting ways in her relation and non-relation to her breasts, right? She's got that famous um, citation that, that you cite where she says, you know, shit, I guess I really am a woman, right? Which is just so poignant. And, and so many of us have found that so, um, so useful. But then these gendered parts of the body get taken up in medicine in really different ways, right? So on the one hand, for some surgeons, the breast is just a part of the body that needs to be removed because it's got a tumor in it, right? But then reconstruction is also considered this, until very recently anyway, this medical necessity, right, where insurance pays for it, insurance will pay for multiple, multiple um, reconstructions. Um, and even, you remember in the 1990s, the FDA took off the silicone breast implants um, for cosmetic surgeries, but not for reconstruction after cancer. And so I was thinking about that just in relation to the, your points about cruel optimism and how the cruel optimism there is so multiple, 
around, you know, it's the doctors, it's the insurance companies, it's the bureaucracies and all of these different kinds of ways. And I, I was just wondering, um, like, how you could, how you could think about cruel optimism in this kind of social, structural way, um, and how that might fit into how you're talking about Sedgwick's cruel optimism toward her cancer, her tumor, her, her body. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first, thank you. And this is terrifying, <laughs> I have to say. I mean, just really surreal to be talking to Lachlan Jane, who I literally um, had started a Lachlan Jane folder on, on my desktop and collected all the articles you were writing prior to Malignant, um, basically while I was being diagnosed and while I was doing my dissertation. So, uh, and that, that became this book. Um, so it's kind of unnerving to even be hearing you talking about my book. Um, and t to be here, it's such an honor, but it's um, thoroughly intimidating. These are like my <laughs> scholarly heroes here. Um, so <laughs> given that, what, I'll try to recall what you even said. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> the short version is, the short version is fine. <laughs> Okay. Um, we just need to have a conversation, and what I wanted to have a conversation about <laughs> was um, I got I think that idea of cruel optimism is so fascinating in relation to the, the optimism and the cruelty of it that takes place in the various different parts of your chapter among yeah. body parts and disavowed body parts, um, but then also the kind of structural economy of the whole. Yeah. Cancer complex. I mean, it, it, actually in my second chapter, I talk a lot more about breasts and breast reconstruction, breast cancer, around the figure of Audre Lorde, and I actually don't talk about it in relation to the theory of cruel optimism. So it's interesting to sort of think about how I can revisit ideas in my second chapter around breast reconstruction and, and against uh, Lauren Berlant's notions of cruel, cruel optimism, and, and you're, I think you're asking about how that can be um, looked at so, so socially, and in a way, I mean, if we say that cruel optimism is an attachment to something that um, is, uh, that threatens your own livelihood, um, you could say that society's attachment to female breasts, the shape of them, whether it, it, they come, they're biological or whether they are uh, artificially produced, is a kind of a, a cruelly optimistic attachment. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Like the gender itself is a cruel optimism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or gendering in that, that needs to conform to a particular shape. Uh, <laughs> Right. Um, and I talk a, little, a lot about that, about what we think a breast is and whether it is largely a shape <laughs> um, and this kind of tyranny of that shape. And, and not only do insurance companies pay for reconstruction, but they will also always pay for reconstruction on the, uh, 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 just to restore symmetry. So on an unaffected breast, you would still have insurance payment to make your your breasts align properly, so that you know really confirms this notion that it's really about the shape of them <laughs> and how much they conform to a society's expectation of how feminine bodies should be and look. Yeah, and there's some kind of alliance about that your gender. It's near. I don't know. It's nearly as if your gender is as important as your life somehow, or that it, oh, absolutely. You know that there's some kind of risks that are definitely worth taking so that you can have your, your gender body. Yeah, and then so with Sedgwick, I mean, it's clear in this chapter that I just adored Sedgwick and how she teasingly says, what if I had three? Um, yeah. You know, just disrupting the notion of the shape of this binary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, because you talk about, you talk about Sedgwick's kind of interest in this topic and and, um, and and the way in which she you know she uses it as an intellectual project and so on and um, 
uh, it was really interesting you talk about um, she about the whale analogy that, that is like the whale, the cancer object that plays, plagues, galvanizes, and destroys one. And um, you had a couple of questions about that. One is, um, you know, everybody has to forge this new relationship with what one becomes, their different body, maybe their different gendered body, um, their sick body, their scarred body. And so I'm wondering if you think um, it's like an inherently if it's a, it becomes an inherently intellectual project for people, mm -hmm. um, or if there's something specific about Sedgwick and how she and how she does it in a very performative public um, way. Well, that's an interesting question. I don't think it's inherently intellectual. I think that's a Sedgwick yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but for Sedgwick, it was extremely emotional. <coughs> Um, but I, I don't think for her that there's any separation, really. So her emotionality is completely intellectualized, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so do you think, because she, she writes a lot about metastatic cancer and from a metastatic perspective, and there's something very visceral about that, like the temporality is in a way very, very different. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that or talk about talk about that in relation to, you know, non-metastatic cancer or or how how you were thinking about your own experience in relation to Sedgwick's um, or something about about that temporal difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sort of goes to the first question that Jim threw out, I think, yeah. um, about what, how cancer illuminates something that you might not have been aware of. Um, and to your response to Mel, which I, I really love the way you've talked about, the temporality of illness. And Sedgwick points out that it, it shifts your sense of um, lifespan. You know, you just, and that was even before her cancer metastasized. I think a diagnosis kind of, of, of a life-threatening illness automatically shifts your, your perspective of lifespan, because immediately, I mean, we are all obviously subject to death, but something about a cancer diagnosis uh, makes that um, irrefutable. <laughs> um, and, you know, then it gets into this whole, and she talks about how, you know, suddenly the relationship between you and a younger student may be flipped, and you and like an older mentor, you know, who actually might outlive you, and you know, so this way, and, and she um, parallels that to kind of shifting relationships in Buddhism, and how the 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 um, the student becomes the well, actually, like reincarnates and becomes the the teacher of the, of of the next one, and um, yeah. So I mean, I think cancer or any, you know, really kind of traumatic illness really disrupts one's kind of conventional expectations about temporality. Yeah, yeah, and you talk about how, um, how illness gives you, or is thought to give you, a privileged access to something. In that, in that conversation, I think, you have about the, teach, the student becoming the teacher mm -hmm. and so on. Um, do, you think that's, do you think that's true? Like, like, like true that it does give you privilege or, or that we think it makes it true, or, or I think it gives you access, um, and maybe it's just how you define what privilege means, <laughs> right? It gives you access, and it could be a kind of for like someone like Sedgwick, it could be a kind of privilege for her because it gives you a privileged insight into something. For others, it, it's just a burden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I had this funny experience last week where I had this, <laughs> I have this um, like idea about myself that I went to all these cancer retreats and I learned how to listen and I learned how to, you know, really be empathetic and take, you know, like a whole different. I became a different person. And then <laughs> last week I was like, no, I'm still a jerk. <laughs> 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 you know? I don't know, um, but I just like like how you're. It's just interesting, right? How, how your narrative about yourself changes over time. Um, um, so anyway, I mean that's 
too much information. Um, but so maybe I can come back to one of the questions that Jim gave us, which is, um, so what do you think, and this was a really interesting question, Joe, what did illness teach you about the function of scholarship? Yeah, you know, I pondered over that so much because I was like, huh, well first I have to think of myself as a scholar. Um, and then, <laughs> and actually, you know, my illness and scholarship are completely bound together because I was doing my dissertation, and I was doing my dissertation after many, many years of having taught and been an artist and made films, and um, so I was sort of returning to after many, a long time, returning to the fold of being a student and being diagnosed, you know, as I was writing my dissertation proposal. So there was so no no way to separate illness and scholarship. Um, and you know, I basically decided to write my dissertation about my illness and and um, and to the only thing I n knew that was steering my scholarship prior to my illness was my interest in psychoanalysis. Um, and then it just occurred to me that Freud suffered from <laughs> cancer for 18 years, and um, therefore, you know, I should actually pay attention to that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. what is it? The function, of, so I, I ended up thinking, okay, well, s scholarship, you know, for me is a way of, of making in the same sense that creative work, like artwork is a way of making, um, and to me, you know, illness, if illness is a process of unmaking, which is somewhat the topic of my book, if illness is a process of unmaking, um, then what we can do, writing, thinking, scholarship, making things, art, work is like a remaking of that kind of ways in which you've been unmade. Yeah. Let me just finish by asking one more, one more follow-up question to that, which is, um, you know, when I started writing *Malignant*, I was pre-tenure and, and, and everything. I was absolutely terrified that, you know, once the word got out, like that was the end of my career. That was the end of tenure, like the end of everything. Mm -hmm. And you started writing as a dissertation, like even <coughs> pre. So I'm just wondering if or how you thought about doing that and coming coming out in that public way. Um. Well, I'm a weird. Bird. <laughs> I had already walked away from tenure, um, which I had been on the track and, and you know all this stuff because I had an MFA. Um, so I had and I had been teaching a long time and making work. So I had already done the walking away from tenure. I kind of had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. I came back to 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 do my dissertation to write, to to make a project, not to try to get a job or to you know actually never thought like to enter the golden halls of scholarship or anything. It was really I wanted to write a pro make, and make a project. Um, so I kind of was fearless in that sense. Yeah, <laughs> liberated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, well thank you so much. Thank Let's you. <laughs>
it's really brilliant to choose to speak from this external but internal <laughs> voice that is both human, sort of, and non-human, sort of. Um, and then for that voice to be plural, to be multiple, as if to convey the multiplicating process of mm -hmm. illness, that it dissembles you and that it renders you into pieces. Um, and in particularly, for your, your case, the multiplication of bacterial growth. Um, so for me, this plurality contrasts with the supposedly singular you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like a kind of alien colony colonizing you. Mm -hmm. um, you turn yourself in the book into the third person, which is a distancing. It's as if your bacteria know more about your story than Patrick. Um, and then, as you say, it, it changes the tense of your story, changes it to what will have been, mm -hmm. um, which is really fascinating. So I'm just so impressed by how you communicated the multivocality of illness. And um, so I guess I'm just inviting you to talk about how you came to narrate it in this way and this distinct position. Hmm. Um, do I have to turn this on or yeah, is it I think on? Okay. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Is it is it more helpful if I hold it just to be sure? Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Um, thank you for asking that set of questions <laughs> in that way. That's one of the most helpful for me way of framing um, the, both the external and the internal polyvocality of the narration. Um, so you've given me something to think about, and I'm going to try to stumble through responding. Um, how I came to how I came to it was um, represented in the book later in a chapter when I'm looking at images of a retinal scan, and I become sort of overwhelmed by the beauty of the scan, which the technician and the retinal specialist sitting next to me wanted to refuse me. I wasn't permitted to see these images as beautiful, um, and I certainly wasn't allowed to uh, transport them to the aesthetic domain. They needed to remain in a clinical domain. Um, and just to provide a bit of description of the images, these are um, they look like planets from afar. They look like deep space photography, but they are um, photographs of a portion of your retina, uh, of my retina, where, um, <laughs> there it is again, I guess, where uh, the evidence of um, infection is a series of sort of cloudy looking spaces and then what look like volcanoes or erupted geysers from above or something. Um, and they sort of took my breath away the first time I saw them. And I asked, I knew what I was doing, but so it wasn't, um, it wasn't just a sort of accidental utterance. But I said, these are gorgeous, who is the artist? And, the, and that's when the clinical persona came in. Um, so I knew what I was doing, but at the same time it was, that moment and then a few similar kinds of moments um, around uh, other, other tissues, so bone tissue, um, some skin, uh, where I started to realize that because of my various altered states, a coma, hallucinations, pain medication, being in and out of surgery, um, I couldn't trust my own telling of this. And so I had to trust, I had to find a way to trust the telling of, um, of this tale by other folks, um, by the gathering of others. And so I turned, I mean, I turned to different things. I turned to the machines that they use. For a while, I thought I would try to write from the perspective of the people who donated the blood that was transfused into me at different time, but that was like, that was too weird. Um, even, <laughs> even for my experience of it, it became a kind of farce. Um, and eventually I ended up with these bacteria because I realized that they must love me <laughs> because I was good for them. Um, and they stayed. <laughs> um, 
And so maybe I loved them too. That's how I, I think how I got there eventually. Wow. Um, so I'm going to jump to my last question because I, you really unexpectedly already addressed it. Um, I was going to ask you about the, how, um, how does love figure into disease? Um, and I asked that because it's related to the question I posed in relation to A. Sedgwick, but that it's obviously very present in your text. Um, yeah. So maybe if you want to say more about love and disease. I mean, there, the first thing my mind goes to, there's this little Italo Calvino story called Mitosis. Does anybody know this little story out there of a few people? And it's this weird story about a cell that undergoes mitosis and splits. And one of the resulting cell, <laughs> cells is obsessed with the abject other, you know, its former <coughs> self-cell or something. Um, it's a weird story because it's profoundly gendered in very conventional and um, discomforting ways at times, but it, it, it's shockingly simple and brilliant in that little move. It, it is, the narrative voice is a half, this formerly half of a, combined cells speaking to the other half through the language of love. Um, you know, so when I hear your question, I think about um, all of the various registers of love that play out in illness, the love of a caregiver for someone who's experiencing illness, a love that is at times unutterable because the frustration and anger of being ill prevents it from being said, of the person who is ill for the people caring. Um, and then the sort of micro registers of love where, you know, when you're in one of those ridiculously uncomfortable hospital beds and you are um, in multiple kinds of pain, um, there are, for example, specific positions that work for a specific duration to minimize the pain. Um, and then they stop working and you move on to another one. And there are also choreographies of micro gestures that work for specific things you need to do with your body to minimize the impact of pain. I remember feeling what I would now call love for, maybe this is also getting at your question, Jim, um, for those positions, choreographies, um, et cetera, and also for the knowledge of them. You know, for the, it, it, it does become unconscious. It becomes like a choreography for dancers that when I feel the, this, this particular, um, uh, vicissitude of pain making itself known. I know to do this with this knee. I, rem I mean, it's almost like the only, at certain points, the only kind of love I could express, aside from for the pain medication and that button, um, was, for, was for the knowing of those things. Um, and that becomes surprisingly useful in the <clears throat> afterlife of, of acute illness, knowing that love can be that precise and about practice in that way, um, demystifies it somehow and makes it less pyramus and thisbe-ish. You know, it becomes about the knowing of precision That last phrase um, is clouding me a little. I'm not sure why, but thank you for that question. Sure. I'm trying to think about how maybe to segue into another one of my questions and be a work backwards that, um, because somehow it's related, I'm not sure. Um, 
Well, I was just really struck by um, the story that you told um, that you used to follow your father at the mall with your hand in his, with his yeah. back pocket. Um, <laughs> that so he, your father wouldn't lose you. Um, and I mean, for me, it, it just jumped out of the page because uh. I also tell a story about Eve Sedgwick, who, and in, in this the chapter selection, I'm not sure I, I go into this, but that. Sedgwick always had a real fear of being lost at the mall. <laughs> um, and then she actually goes to like the, the lost and found, um, which in this particular mall was basically like a box with gloves and other like, uh, I don't know, hats or something. Um, so anyway, and, but there was also this kind of echoing with um, Sedgwick's story about um, about um, wanting to keep her therapist in her pocket mm -hmm. and then actually taking the therapist's business card um, and, and putting in her pocket. Anyway, there's this, for me, like this kind of parallel in terms of thinking about pockets. Um, Mel also brings up El mm -hmm. Ellie Claire's story about stones mm -hmm. and pockets. And to me, I, when I was thinking about the pocket, I was like, what, is the, what does this mean? It's, it's a kind of form of containment. And it's mm -hmm. a, I called it a kind of portable holding environment. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow it's related to like fear of loss. It's a form of attachment, mm -hmm. um, but it's in the shape of a kind of an absence. Um, and an absence that can be contained. Um, I don't know. This is just throwing out. Uh, maybe you might want to talk something about how um, illness is related to loss and attachment. Mm -hmm. and this, concept of, of what can <coughs> be contained? Mm. The f I mean, the first thing, I love that little story. Nobody's ever asked me about that little that story. story. It's such the a story weird like story. Um, but thank you for that. I have, uh, my child body remembers what that felt like. For those who don't know that section, it's little Patrick used to put his hand in his father's back pocket in busy places so that he wouldn't get lost and of course he got lost and found himself standing in the parking lot with his hand in some other man's <laughs> back pocket um, which uh, um, foreshadowed a lot. Um, <laughs> the first thing I think of is there's another kind of pocket in my experience of illness which is pockets of infection. Um, and so pockets become, especially for orthopedic surgeons, they become a way to talk about abscesses um, that are sort of micro abscesses. So if, for example, um, I had an infection in the bone, you know, in my hand, then they would describe uh, the sort of pockets of bacterial infection. Um, that then require a, 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 a kind of precision surgery to go in and clean out all of those pockets. So pockets are sites of all kinds of things, um, desire, uh, but also danger. Um, that's the first thing my mind goes to, I'm not sure where else to go from there. But I love that you pull out that story. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I love that story, and I actually did, I think I remembered that it resonated with the idea of the, oh. the pocket of, of bacterial growth. Um, is one more question? Um, so I'm wondering if you want to speak something about the isolation and sociality of illness. Mm. You described this scene um, in which you're highly infectious and you couldn't be touched. Um, I'm thinking about what it's like to be the object of fear and threat when you are yourself afraid and threatened. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, but there's also a kind of converse side to that. There's a kind of sociality in mm. the illness. And in my book, I talked about the bardo of dying that Sedgwick brought up um, as a place where people are together um, in a public sphere of illness. Mm. I, I was thinking a lot about being quarantined when I was rereading Mel's book, so this is a good transition question. Um, 
It's so, it, I, I still don't know if I know how to talk about it because there's both, you know, my experience of acute and very specific illness um, is part of what led me to begin thinking about a critique of empathy for a later project. Um, out of a desire to forestall comparative affective work on the part of that bardo of others. Um, and at the same time, again, in my specific experience, I, I was so utterly dependent that, you know, I could frame it as interdependence only because I had to be there in order to be so dependent, but that was about as far as it went. Um, as, that was about as far as my participation in the sociality went. Um, so it's a it's a uh, it's a calculus of extremes in a weird way to think about this question. It's it's as profound a question as mortality and morbidity and and prognostic time and. It's as profound a question as um, being itself, and I still don't know how to fully answer it. I resort to these extremes to talk about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's the question I dwell in more than any other, I think. Thank you for those questions, that was great. Thank you for Thank your you. responses and your book. Thank you. wrote down my questions. Um, I think some of these questions are strange. Good. But one of the, um, I mean, I wanted to start by thanking you on behalf of all of us for this brilliant and just stunningly beautiful book. Um, one of the great things about it is that I think it invites strange questions and it, you know, desires them. So hopefully, um, hopefully these will qualify. Um, I thought I'd start with a less strange question that you've probably gotten before. Um, and I, I'm more comfortable when I can write things out, so I'll read these. Is it helpful to you to have a copy of them? Sure. Okay, yeah. great, great. Thank you. You can ignore the notes at the top. Those well, I'll great. listen to you primarily. Okay. Um, okay, so your writing throughout the book feels to me infused with affect, even in the midst of the most scholarly discussions and interventions. I felt the tenderness of your prose in both senses of that word, both a kind of bruisedness and a kind of love. Um, do you feel this too whenever you return to the text or, or are invited to discuss it? Wow, well, I've never gotten a question like this. You, you thought oh, I had. Boy. I hadn't, it's a beautiful question. Um, I think, um, I, I do. I feel that I see the tenderness still there, mm. and it's not hard to feel it again. Um, and I don't know if that's related to how alive that memory remains. Mm. And I do speak as someone who is much. I mean, these quantifications are ridiculous, but yeah, I'm much less sick, right? Like, uh, uh, or I, I am maybe profoundly transformed in 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 such a way as to appear more socially fluent. Um, but the tenderness of the prose for me and the affect of it was all about um, the ill fit of everything, the, the impossibility of grammar as I experienced it at the time, and somehow having to perform the confidence that something would come out of it anyway. Um, So that making sense was less the point than um, uh, offering something th that might have some sense to it, but was not only in terms of sense. Hmm. Yeah. I love that answer. Um, OK, now these questions become more specific. Um, and if that one seemed weird, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe these won't seem weird, but here we go. 
So there are two moments in the chapter at which you use the word today very differently than in other moments in the book where that word is used. So elsewhere through the book you'll say, so like today in scholarship or in thinking about the environment or whatever. <clears throat> um, but in these two moments, that word signifies a shift in attention to situate yourself in the intimate present. Today I am having a day of relative well-being and am eager to explore my neighborhood. And later, my invocation of autism in relation to mercurial affect is, as I write today, to a certain degree experimental. Did those ring a bell? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Um, I wonder if you might think out loud about the pivot between those two todays, from a state of being ill, a day of being ill, which, <clears throat> because it's in writing, is many, many days, many, many todays, um, to a state of scholarly writing. I wonder if you might also think out loud about their effect on the intimacy that readers might feel or assume with you especially in light of your writing about the couch. Does the question make sense? I think so, or at least what I hear of it is another wonderful question. Um, I kind of want to now call you every day, but okay. <laughs> so, um, but I, I'm feeling that y you, you are even more wonderful to think with than I thought. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, so I do remember both todays and um, they are different, and um, I think the first was almost um, uh, in an, a kind of a very wishful invitation, like an urging um, to the reader to join me um, for better and worse. <laughs> uh, and I think I perform that today as part of a reiterated invitation to, to be there with me as opposed to the previous modes, I think the previous chapter, which was much more about the kind of formal analysis of how that toxicity was working in um, the kind of US you know, zeitgeist. Um, uh, so this was a, it was a more intimate call. Um, uh, and I think in some kind of way, a risky one, obviously. Mm. Um, and the second today is, um, for me, uh, a kind of humility. I think that many of the topics about which we've been writing, um, um, kind of uh, um, unique forms of extreme illness, um, forms of cancer, kinds of chronicity um, that, that are not generally seen as employable kinds. Um, there, there's always a, a kind of, um, they're, they're, exclusive, they're explosive words, they're explosive statements. Um, and I don't know about your all experiences, but um, moving towards some of them felt incredibly dangerous. Mm. Um, autism is already something that has been exposed to many dangers, right? So people with autism have been um, taken to all the wrong ends mm. by forms of scholarship or by forms of medicine, and so I was trying to ask how I could take on the thing that was certainly being asked for this work without somehow doing the same violence. And so that today is a kind of gesture of humility somehow, like an attempt to condition the, the connections I'm trying to draw um, with whatever success. But um, those were, yeah, so those were actually a shift from a very urgent today to a attenuated, um, kind of humility kind of today. I think I can say with great success. Um, okay, I have two more questions. I have time for these, okay. There are three moments wow. <laughs> in which eye contact appears, as it were, as a complex kind of social practice, one that variously reveals fixity and dislocation with respect to attachment and relationality. Looking into the eyes of a racist passerby, looking in the general direction but not at your lover while on the couch, being unable to meet someone's gaze as an index of becoming autism spectrum. 
I'm curious about these, especially as eye, con eye contact historically has been a social practice infused with all kinds of social positioning. It's assumed to demonstrate and facilitate intimacy and engagement at the same time that it manages and polices racialized, gendered, and classed difference in social arrange arrangements. And I made a witty little note that I patted myself on the back for. A dissertation could be written, or maybe has, <laughs> on Victorian literature as a genre defined by anxiety about eye contact. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> okay, um, so is the loss of eye contact as a symptom of illness itself a kind of method or something other than loss? Might it promote another kind of perhaps transobjective relationality even as it seems to defy the expected conditions of engagement and knowledge, for that matter. Gosh, gosh, your questions are amazing. Uh, absolutely, yes, uh, but I didn't obviously think about it in these terms, so I thank you so much for this kind of interpretation. It's really beautiful. Um, Eye contact became a tyranny, and I'm surely, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that there are many people for whom it is experienced as a tyranny, and for many different kinds of socialities, for many different kinds of, of medicalized ways of being, you know, for many um, historical eras or, you know, cultural locations. Um, um, but the intensity of the tyranny, um, as I experienced it, um, was such that it was, um, exhausting and required uh, a, a huge shift of how I spent my time. Um, so besides the chemical sensitivity, I think that I needed the relief of being transobjective um, outside of human spheres. And so I think the, my intimacy with the couch is very much um, connected to uh, the shift away from interhuman eye contact. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but actually, I think because animals have, have, have joined our table, there's a lot that I, I'd love to think about with regard to animal eye contact, because I, I have had cats, and we looked at each other a whole lot. <laughs> and I don't need to go dairy da or anything either. Anyway, there's, I think, um, there's something about the tyranny of, let's say, late capitalist, <laughs> intrahuman, interhuman eye contact um, that became very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I do think um, uh, that, that, that because of um, not only this kind of tyranny that invisibly works within a loosely social space, but actually highly controlled space like the academy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems super cash here, and it is, but it is also, right? Deeply regimented in terms of bodies and race, you know, uh, racialization and um, disability ability. So, um, uh, so there are lessons in willingly taking it up um, as, method, whether we like that term or not, some sort of like taking an attitude in relation to eye contact. Um, but to bring up what you were saying about privilege, I think um, there are also questions about what one can do to afford not to look. Um, uh, so one of the things that um, being a practicing academic with these variable forms of illness has um, taught me is how deeply, uh, um, how deeply written the requirements for bodily and intellectual performance are, right? But that the invisible mercenary in all of this is the body, um, insofar as we, you know, accept that that division. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and the last question, which since you wanted a question about animals. Um, <laughs> twice you refer to kinship with non-human animals within this chapter. 
once in critical engagement with Agamben's bare life, and again in your discussion of autism. At the same time, you encourage a frame of transobjectivity so as to turn away from inquiries that center on, and this is a brief, uh, these are your words, social states and capacities possessed by one animate entity or another. I'm curious about the space between these two invocations. Um, so on one hand, kinship with non-human animals, and on the other, a frame of transobjectivity that's meant to move away from the question of social capacity. Um, uh, and in particular, I'm wondering if a re-centering of trans-objectivity might also absorb or be intoxicated by some affect itself. When the rock crushes climbers, to use the example from your introduction, would it be mere anthropomorphism to assume that the rock might have some affective relation to that activity or to those hikers? In gathering particles from the air, might the filters in a mask be practicing some kind of attachment or gathering? And finally, a question with even higher stakes, is mercury something like a member of the wedding? Okay, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have the reference oh. of a member of the wedding. So, a mem I, again, I felt so witty. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but wedding. you remain witty. I, I don't. No, yeah. it's embarrassing. Um, a Member of the Wedding is a Carson McCullers story that was a, um, a film in what year? Oh, it became a play. I saw yeah. the play. Okay. Yes, okay. Wow, I'm witty too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, now I've lost myself. <laughs> I think in learning from your own work, Patrick, I, I would um, I would be, I feel like you set me up with an answer here, right? That um, I would never want to say that is mere anthropomorph uh, anthropomorphism for, for the rock to um, crush the, sorry, to, to a sort of, it might have some effective relation to its crushing of the hikers. Um, and the delimitation, right, of the conceptual languages we're, we're working with, it's sort of been, right, the subject of my work in relation to animacies. And so I'm always striving for what will carry us outside of the strictures of those very narrow ways of thinking about action and relation, um, interdependency, with the point which you made so very well. Um, trying to think about Mercury as a member of the wedding, but then of course, yes. I mean, <laughs> um, I think uh, the, the thing that um, strikes me over and over again is the, the pile of exceptions that have been um, built upon each other and in relation to each other to create um, reason, to create the reason with which I think we are still working in large part. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm worried about the, the, the worlds of exclusion that that reason continues to mm. perpetuate. Um, and I don't know if it's partly about the kind of crisis time that, that, that we seem to increasingly occupy, uh, especially in California perhaps, but um, I think it's high time um, we uh, very seriously went collectively mad in that um, the um, the forms of authorized knowledge are are doing so many violences. Um, and this isn't to say that the solutions are, are simple. I think you know many, many, many people have been um, struggling with um, how to move beyond and yet stay somewhat with these um, strictures, right? Um, but but um, I don't know if it would make sense as a wrap up to just think about the invocation of illness as a form of sometimes 
practicing madness. Um, and I, it's a huge reach and it's a huge generalization. Um, but but I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about um, the ordinariness of practices that we use to build up and procure and shore up forms of reason and um, common sense, even in um, the most sort of erudite um, fields in which everything is theoretically put to question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I gave you a super remote answer. No. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Thank you so much. I just have to say again, thank you for writing this book. Thank you, Patrick. That used to happen, like when I was giving talks on the cancer stuff before I would come out is I'd get these questions from the audience and they'd be like, well, I've had cancer and I can tell you that, you know, bracket, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, whatever. But, um, so I feel like there's, a, there's something to be learned there about situating oneself, but not speaking for everybody with, you know, with whatever it is that you're, that you're um, trying to do, but then you, but, but that, that position can also give you, even though it's probably not right, it can give you permission to push things a little farther than you might think or, or whatever. I feel like you can push things pretty far if you give the right caveats, maybe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, do you mind if I use oh. your mic? Oh, yours got one. Mine was pilfered. Yeah. Mine was taken away. <laughs> um, I would just like to say that there should be a dissertation written about the <laughs> Q&A after talks yes. when you're writing about illness, particularly personal experience with yes. illness, because it's bizarre. Um, it's, a, it's a genre, a comedy, <laughs> it's a diagnostic genre, somehow. I just have one practical suggestion. If a part of what you're asking about entails research that requires you to speak to people who have had um, experiences with suffering um, in order to understand those experiences. This is just a little suggestion for how to begin those conversations. If, um, so if you're interviewing, say, or engaging someone in conversation, if you begin with a question like, if you were trying to understand, you know, so if I'm talking to you and I say, if you could, if, if you could, um, if you were in my shoes right now, what kind of question would you ask? And what kind of question would you not ask? Um, and if they're willing to answer that question, then that, as a, um, it's one little strategy for helping you mark out what kinds of things for that specific person would be ethical for you to get to know better and maybe leave as um, too much. But I may be misunderstanding your question, so, so sorry. Can I, can I say something, I guess? Um, I mean, I, I hear a lot of things in that question, um, so I guess I'm gonna answer it in a few different ways. Um, I mean, one I think what Lofton was already sort of suggesting is uh, and I think I hope that my book and certainly the other ones all model a form of address that is um, doesn't uh, assume that we were speaking on behalf of anyone other than ourselves. Um, and I think that scholars in training have a much more difficult time than say artists who are tr pretty much trained to kind of um, delve into their own personal experience and it's not something that's taboo in any way in fact it's sort of encouraged and of course one needs to always ask ethical questions about the use of yourself but it's an expectation in arts in a way that isn't true in scholarship um, but the last thing I guess I'll say is as um, as somebody who trained as I trained as a psychoanalyst for a number of years 
And the way that you're asking the question about your ability to hurt someone else based on your own writing and their reading is a, a little bit, I don't mean this in a, I don't mean to be really critical, but it's a little un omnipotent, <laughs> psychoanalytically speaking, like to assume that you have that kind of power over somebody else is, is um, I wouldn't worry about it in other words, in that way. What I would worry about is how to, um, you know, kind of refine the, your voice. Um, and, and it's like these, all these examples are ways in which, you know, you are taking a kind of voice that isn't making an assumption that, you know, you're speaking about all illness for everyone. I think it definitely has shifted for me. Um, the writing of my book came, uh, like, like other folks at this table, at a time of um, sort of either I was going to make it through tenure or I wasn't, and I, I nevertheless I had nothing to write about except um, working through what this illness, you know, was making available to me. Um, so uh, I couldn't help but have it be part of my academic presence, and that did extend to my um, teaching. I just saw al already how many students were hiding um, various forms of um, invisible disability or chronic illness or um, other kinds of precarity, right? I mean, I think the, the levels of precarity for any student today are just remarkable, right? So there's something about um, my, I felt motivated by their example to take up some of the burden um, of disclosing uh, what I was working with. And I remember one day in which I actually couldn't remember anything anybody was saying seconds after they'd said it. And I was either gonna pretend, like, uh-huh, uh -huh. <laughs> good point. <laughs> or I was gonna say, like, I'm gonna try to be present for this class in a different way. And it, I'm doing the unforgivable, which is I'm forgetting what you're saying, but um, let's see what we can do together, which teaching obviously always is, right? It, it's always a kind of experiment of collaboration. So I learned a lot from just having to be in that, um, that position. Yeah. I, um, so I've, I've also noticed, Jim and I were talking about this before, that there is a kind of willingness to talk about experiences with illness, and even with diagnosis, more than I remember being in the room when I was a student. Um, but one of the things I've noticed is that as offices for students with disabilities have become institutionalized in the particular way that they have, and they are extremely important necessary parts of any university that goes without saying. Um, the students who come into my classroom recently who have the signed OSD accommodation letter and so on, or, and, and so on actually need the classroom to humanize them in ways that they feel that that letter doesn't. And they need to have their accommodation requirements personalized um, and nuanced in a way that the letter in some ways prohibits so that um, it's hard to talk about this because those offices are so important and I want them to be more funded, not less, um, and more staffed, certainly, and not less. But just in the last few years, I've noticed that when I take the time, even in a huge lecture class, to meet slowly with the students who have these accommodations and look up from the letter and say, what do you actually need? No limits, just tell me what it is that you actually feel would help you do what you need to do. Um, not only do they then feel that they're being accommodated in precise ways, they feel humanized in ways that our classrooms aren't always humanizing them. Um, so, 
you know, I've taught this book in classes. I've had the experience of feeling vulnerable in front of students and finding ways to let that be comfortable. <laughs> um, it's definitely productive and leads me to think all sorts of new things, but it's not typically comfortable. Um, it's, I've had those experiences, and it's the way in which illness specifically promotes a relation to being in institutionalized um, and finding workable conditions for one's being outside of that institutionalization together um, that's created a whole new pedagogy for me. Sort of a long answer, but... It was through pain that illness changed my writing um, in a very specific way. Um, medical institutions in the U.S. Um, are, have no idea what to do with pain, generally speaking. They have lots of new technologies for finding it, uh, uh, describing it in specific terms, but um, and that they have ways of thinking about pain as a kind of technology itself. Um, they I mean, they want nothing more than they want to be able to think about pain as data, as quantifiable. Um, but in partnership with the pharmaceutical industry, they have no way of understanding pain. This is not a new argument. Um, uh, within the institutions, you will occasionally find someone who almost always has a history in another medical tradition that isn't just um, allopathy, um, who teaches you this very specific thing um, about how to be a person in pain um, strategically so that you can get that pain treated in the right way. And, and I've, I mean, so I had this experience with a particular nurse practitioner at a particular hospital in the Bay Area. And as I've, when I've talked to other people with similar kinds of experiences, they too have described finding someone who taught them how to actually get their pain treated um, or even make space for pain within these institutions. And it is always through thick, baroque, over-the-top description and metaphor and allegory and artistry. It was always through, um, you know, every, there, there's so many classes of pain medication and everyone actually works on a different kind of pain and a different temporality of pain. But they're treated as a class of drugs that um, at least in my case, were sort of thrown one right after the other um, to deal with pain that in fact certain chemicals will never treat. Um, but when I learned to describe, to pictorialize, um, and so on, I was able to make myself uh, the subject in my own painful experience, if that makes sense, and find strategies for treating it. Um, it was through that, I think, that writing about other things that weren't pain um, shifted for me. I would just add something, um, which is I, I've always been really interested in writing just as a practice, which is one of the reasons I went to um, do my PhD with um, Donna Haraway, because I was really interested in her writing strategy. Um, but somehow, once I was in treatment, I found myself, it sounds cheesy, but like writing a lot of poetry. And then, um, kind of in, in parallel to writing Malignant, I started taking a bunch of poetry classes mm -hmm. and just kind of taking that seriously. And, um, and then that ended up, I think, really affecting how I was thinking about the structure, of, like just the structure of sentences and, and, and how I wanted to describe what I wanted to describe through a kind of poetics. So that was kind of just a... Um, an interdisciplinary writing, you know. Yeah. Um, as I was sort of mentioning, I mean, my first public writing was writing through illness. Um, so I think how it changed is hard because it was sort of formed, through, my writing was formed through 
through writing about illness. Um, but I think I realized that if I was to write about people who were vulnerable, that I had to be vulnerable myself. Um, and that, that was necessary for me to bear myself in the writing. Um, and then the other thing would be, it's kind of a response to the larger question around scholarship. Um, and you know, coming to scholarship from, from maybe more of the arts, scholars seem to want to seek an explanation. And I realized through my whole medical odyssey that explanation was kind of impossible. Like, you know, cancer diagnosis kind of defied explanation. So I had to learn to write that uncertainty. Like, to live in that uncertainty and to write that uncertainty into the prose. Well, I guess, like, you know, just kind of just to start amusing is it? Amusing, two words. Um, like it, it becomes so wrapped up in it. So now I don't even know what the experience would be without the book because it, the book gives it this long, very particular tail and shape that, um, like, I don't even know now what it would be like to separate it out. I mean, you could. I was going to say something similar. It gives structure to traumatic repetition, but it doesn't stop the flashbacks or the nightmares. It, but it gives it structure, it gives it a vocabulary um, that allows it to transform into something else. So yeah, I, don't, I can't think about the one without the other. It could be better, it could be worse. It's hard to know. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, um, my relationship to illness is always changing because it's always doing something weird to me. Whatever this me is, it's always doing something weird to it. And that um, has consequences for the words that come out. Um, and so for me as a writer, the, the relationship between body and writing is um, ever surprising and necessarily experimental. Uh, I just don't know what's going to come out next, and, and I think um, I've finally begun to enjoy being okay with that or sort of looking forward to seeing what comes out. Um, in some ways, it's a relationality to the illness itself, right? So if the subject, if the illness is a subject, which I'm not sure at all it is, but if whatever this, this illness is, is having some form of expression, right? I have basic mechanics, but there's something else that may not quite be me. I'm hearing echoes of you, Patrick, but um, you know that that is also present in the room. And um, I suppose, um, as a teacher, I do try to encourage uh, that uh, sort of a movement away from the exceptional me uh, or the clearly delineated me um, when when students are are trying to write through these kinds of um, very difficult um, junctures of, of relationship to themselves and to their illness. Um, I don't know if this really answers it, and I, uh, I hadn't even really thought of this until you asked the question, like how it changed me. Um, but maybe this is just like a, maybe this will be helpful in terms of how you might approach writing uh, about your illness. It, that for me, I, I wrote it through other people. Um, I wrote it through studying about Freud, about Audre Lorde, about Eve Sedgwick. And then after that, um, I made my film. Um, and the, at the point at which I was making a feature film, I had long been in remission. So my own illness was in the past tense, but I kind of learned a lot about illness in general through talking to 27 people that I talked to to make the film. So it, it gave me a different kind of access, um, which maybe that could be helpful for you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.